by long, 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 Welcome to worship this morning at Trinity Presbyterian Church. It's so good to see each of you here, um, as well as those of you on our Facebook live stream this morning. Here are these words from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter. The Lord makes a new covenant with us, and we are God's people, and the Lord is our God. Friends, let us worship this God.
Please rise in body or spirit and join me in the call to worship using the words printed in your bulletin. Lift up your voice and call out to God. We cry out, believing that God hears us. Come together and wait for God. We come together, trusting that God is still speaking. Surely God's presence is here with us now. We wait in hope, for God's steadfast love lifts our hearts. Come worship the Lord. We celebrate the power of God that restores us. Now let's sing together the opening hymn, Spirit, Open My Heart, number 692 in your hymnal. may be seated. Let us consider the depth of our relationships with those we encounter and with the one who calls us to faith as we together confess our sin using the prayers for forgiveness which is printed in your bulletin. We confess, anointed one, that we excuse ourselves from reaching out to those who need your care. We take your words that there will always be unmet needs as a reason not to try to meet the needs we can. Forgive us and help us to change. Renew our determination to live as faithful followers and disciples. Help us to work with you for the well-being of your creation.
Amen. Friends, we too are a part of the way maker's will for restoration. We are called through Christ to strive for restoration, but we are not called to do it alone. The one who has made a way in the wilderness and rivers and the desert will surely equip for us all that we are asked to do in Christ's name. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God for this news. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us share signs of peace with one another. Good morning. I haven't met a lot of y'all here at the rug. I'm trying to understand a particular teaching that Jesus taught the disciples um, right before he was about to die about how to take care of each other and how to see Jesus in our everyday lives. And so this is a retelling of Matthew 25 that is later going to be read in our worship service, but this is another way of looking at it. When you leave to go to school, your parent might say something important to remember. They might say, have a good day, or do something nice today, ask a good question. After Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time and before he ate the special Passover meal with his friends, he taught things he wanted people to remember about how to live when he was no longer with them. If he were telling you the story today, it might sound like this. Jesus might say to you, I want you to remember four things. The first is that I love you. The second thing Jesus says is to love Jesus with all of your heart. A parent or family member says I love you to you. They show their love in this way. They show their love by giving you food when you're hungry. And when you come in from playing outside, there is water to drink. And when you get ready for school, there are clean clothes for you to wear. And if you're ever in trouble and need someone to talk to, your family and friends are there and ready to listen to you. And that's a way that they love you. The third important thing Jesus tells us is that you can't really see me but you can see me, you can see Jesus and others when you do kind things for them. So when you help serve a meal to people who are hungry or when you spend time with a friend who is sad or you save money to a group for a group that helps people or you sit with someone at school who's eating alone in the cafeteria, or you help your parents buy clothes or toys for children in Starkville, or you make friends with someone who doesn't have any friends, or you help someone who needs help, maybe they're in a wheelchair and they're having issues opening a door. When you help people, Jesus is there with you. The circle of your love can be very big, and Jesus says the fourth thing to remember is that Jesus is with us, watching that circle grow by all of the nice things we do for one another. So that's something the adults, their children, our youth, myself, our leaders, are trying to figure out, is how we can, um, we can be God's love by helping others, and understanding that when we're helping each other, we're also helping Jesus. And that's really, really important. 
and really, really special that Jesus teaches us um, about, about him being with us even when we can't see him. Let's pray. We all repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for your love, for our family's love, and our church's love. Help us to love our neighbors. Amen. Thanks, y'all. Please join in the hymn of gathering at number 474 as a child. As we approach God's word, let us pray for the Spirit to illumine our hearts and our minds. Gracious God, our way in the wilderness, guide us by your word through these 40 days and minister to us with your Holy Spirit so that we may be reformed, restored, and renewed through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture today is from Psalm 131. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul is like the weaned child that is with me. O oh Israel, Hope in the Lord from this time on and forevermore.
the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 1 through 13. Um, I invite the congregation to join me in the disciples' um, line about halfway through. It's in bold and italicized, hard to miss. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the courtyard of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and they conspired to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. Now, while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar, a very costly ointment, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, Why this place? For this ointment could have been sold for a large sum, and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this ointment on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. We live not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. Thanks be to God. For you always have the poor with you. This line can haunt me off and on. It has for years leaving me and other Christians to wonder, what is our mission, if not to eradicate the conditions that cause poverty? What are we doing here, if not helping our neighbors and ourselves live into God's kingdom of abundance and mutual care? And what does it mean for Jesus to say, This nearly immediately after his well-known teaching in Matthew 25, the one I shared a little bit of with the children, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we did these things to you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these siblings of mine, you did it to me. These words in the 25th chapter of Matthew, which I hope are beginning to become familiar to us, are what Jesus has just finished teaching when today's gospel lesson begins. As he prepares his disciples for a time of judgment and entering into the kingdom of God, he emphasizes the significance of helping those who are hungry those who are thirsty, those who are strangers, those who are naked, those who are sick, and those who are in prison. These are Christ's own, his own brothers and sisters and siblings, and he takes the time to really stress the importance of taking care of them, or perhaps, better put, taking care of each other. 
And so keep that lesson in your mind, the lesson the disciples just received, and place yourself in their shoes, just as you did when you joined me in the reading. You think you're finally coming to understand what Jesus wants you to do, and so you head to Simon's house in Bethany, and then a woman comes forward with expensive ointment and pours it on Jesus' head. Do you get their response of why this waste? I know I definitely tend to throw this sort of thinking and even judgment around. Maybe you've reacted in similar ways in your lives. What a waste of resources. That oil could have been auctioned off or sold at the pawn shop and the proceeds could have been given to Starkville Strong or to Casserole Kitchen to help our neighbors who need more to survive. And then we and the disciples receive a sort of whiplash from Jesus' answer to them, which defends the woman and her pricey oil being dumped on his head, leaving us with this line, which has been easily manipulated by Christians to defend budget decisions or to excuse themselves from reaching out and helping neighbors in need. You always have the poor with you. Some have taken this text to argue that we will never solve the problem of poverty, and so one can justify nearly any lavish use of money or resources, even as a congregation. What can easily be lost in reading this text is that Jesus as he does throughout the Gospel of Matthew, is referencing the Hebrew scriptures when he acknowledges the poor always being with the disciples, always being with us. Here, Jesus is referring back to the book of Deuteronomy. The first 30 chapters of Deuteronomy are filled with sermons preached by Moses to prepare the newly liberated Israelites for their new life of freedom from the Egyptians living in the promised land. These sermons are filled with retellings of their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and the Lord's care for them throughout their trauma, along with laws and guidelines for this new community that they will be upon entering the promised land. And so in the 15th chapter of Deuteronomy, the Israelites receive laws for observing a sabbatical year a year of Sabbath to occur every seven years. Every seventh year you shall grant a remission of debts, Moses begins. There will, however, be no one in need among you because the Lord is sure to bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as a possession to occupy. If only you obey the Lord your God by diligently observing this commandment, that I command you today. If only you will obey the Lord your God by diligently observing the command to cancel debts every seven years, there will be no one in need among you. This is what God promises the people of Israel through the lips of Moses. And a few verses later, Moses says, if there is anyone among you in need, a member of your community and any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your neighbor. So after promising that there will be nobody in need, if the Israelites keep God's law of forgiving one another and taking part in this radical economic structure that God is suggesting, Moses gives further instructions in the event that there are neighbors who need assistance because the people of the promised land were not able to follow that teaching in such a perfect way. And then to wrap up this specific instruction, Moses concludes, since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. Suddenly, Moses is abandoning all of the conditional statements 
as if he knows that it will be nearly impossible for this community of people to follow God's teachings to the T, to leave behind the ways of life that were taught to them in their oppression and enslavement in Egypt. He no longer says, if there are some in need, but he says, since there will never cease to be some in need. Because there will always be some in need. Open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land, Moses tells them. And this is exactly what Christ is referring to as he shocks us, his 21st century followers, with the line, you will always have the poor among you. To further stir the disciples and ourselves, it's helpful to hear these words from Catholic theologian Lori Brink. The fact that this Simon has a house in Bethany may indicate that this village was a location of one of those houses of the poor in which people with diseases could reside a safe distance from the holy city. Despite his former infirmity, Simon owns a home in the village, which suggests a long-term residence, and archaeologists have excavated at least four large ritual baths on the southern limit of ancient Bethany. The presence of so many installations, Brink writes, could be in response to the need of pilgrims preparing to go to Jerusalem. However, they could also be necessary if the area welcomed the sick poor. The discussion about the use or waste of the expensive ointment has new relevance if the village was known for its care of the sick and the poor. So not only has Jesus pulled this line out after teaching his disciples to care for the least of these in a variety of ways, but he has also said it perhaps in a town that was known for taking care of the sick and the poor among them in very visible and public ways of ritual baths so that the infirmed can be a part of a community. Will we always have the poor among us? Many days, I would say most days, I'm afraid that this is true. I'm afraid that Moses knew his people well enough to anticipate that they would fail their neighbors and the strangers in their midst. And I'm worried that Jesus had experienced enough corruption and manipulation to know that there was little hope of us humans following the kingdom's ways of forgiveness and solidarity. Opening the newspaper easily brings about a myriad of reasons why we as a society will continue to get all of this caring for one another wrong in one way or another. We're living in a state that has a reputation of being among the last on many lists. Last week, while I was in Puerto Rico, I heard a lecture from a sociology professor, and in his efforts to explain the conditions that the Puerto Rican people face in their relationship with the United States, he told us, we are better off than many of our Latin American neighbors. But at the same time, we are worse off than the poorest people of Mississippi. He had no clue anyone from Mississippi was in the room, but he knew that this comparison would be significant enough of a negative superlative for all of us. It's no secret that the poor are among us and that the poor can be us as well in this sanctuary. But, as we know, Jesus is journeying to the cross and journeying to a resurrection. We too, I think, still have to journey in hope. Hope for Jesus' siblings who are in chronic and temporary need of a helping hand. And so, to lean into that hope, I invite you to stick around after worship, get some coffee next door, but come back into the sanctuary at 11 to hear from someone who knows our context better than most of us do, who is spending her days side by side with our siblings who are unhoused, food insecure, underemployed, and unemployed. 
we'll welcome Brandi Harrington, who is the Executive Director of Starkville Strong, and she'll lead us in a special Sunday school session about what she is witnessing, about what Starkville Strong strives to do for our community, and hopefully for an invitation of how we can jump in even deeper than we already have. For those on our Facebook live stream, we will start a live stream back up shortly before 11 so you can join in in that experience. And I'm hoping there'll be time for questions and answers as we wonder, will we always have the poor among us in Starkville? How can we alter that truth? The poor might always be among us. As long as our leaders and our churches and our neighborhoods, as long as we don't get it together. The poor will be among us until we dream up and live into and continuously create a society, society that lives out new and radical ways of loving one another. Let us discover that together. All glory be to the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we together affirm our faith using words from the Gospel of Matthew, which is printed in your bulletin. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did to one of the least of these siblings of mine, you did it to me. additions to our church prayer list, which is emailed out um, in the newsletter every Thursday, additions and updates. Um, we pray for Chuck Kenzie and his family. Um, Chuck is Nancy Underwood's best friend's son, who has been on our prayer list for a while um, and is um, living with stage four colon cancer and went to the hospital recently and um, is declining, they believe. Um, so we pray for, for that family and the Underwoods as well. We also pray for Rosie's mother-in-law, who she told me is in the hospital and also um, likely declining and towards the end. And then we pray for our neighbors across Mississippi and Amory and Rolling Fork and Silver City um, as they, they see what, what destruction has brought their towns and neighborhoods. Um, Greg Goodwiller, our executive presbyter, um, sent an email last night letting us know that he will be in touch um, with our uh, congregation, our friends in Amory, as well as the folks in Mississippi Presbytery, which is where um, Rolling Fork and Silver City are. Um, and so they will keep us updated on how we can tangibly help as these communities figure out what they need for help. Are there any other additions or? updates. Tom Fisher, hip replacement surgery. Thank you. Let us go to God in prayer. God of our life, 
whose presence sustains us in every circumstance, in storm and distress, hear our prayer. May those who have been spared nature's fury as well as those whose lives are changed forever by ravages of wind and water find solace, sustenance, and strength in the days of recovery and rebuilding that come. We ask for sustaining courage for those who are suffering, wisdom and diligence among agencies and individuals assessing damage and directing relief efforts, and for generosity to flow as powerfully as rivers and streams, responding to the deep human needs emerging in the wake of these storms. May every tear be dried as we join the work of your restless spirit, hovering even now over the waters and winds of chaos, creating, healing, and birthing your new community of justice and wholeness for all of creation and the creatures who dwell in it. Lord of love and light, shine into our lives and bring your love into our souls. Remind us of the amazing ways you have loved us, even when we turned our backs on you. Open our hearts to receive your loving spirit. Open our minds to receive your wisdom. Open our hands to show others your loving compassion. Lord of love and light, we hold in our hearts those around us who feel unloved. We bring them to you for you to shine your love into their lives. We hold in our minds those who, who are overwhelmed by their needs and difficulties. We hold in our hands your loving compassion to give them. Shine forth your light and love to open everyone's minds to you and your ways, to others and to new and fresh ideas, O oh God. There are people and places that need our hands reaching out to them with your loving compassion. May our reaching out to them with your love and compassion shine forth your light and love to all of the world. God of love and light, we pray for all of those whose names we know who need signs of hope and restoration that you bring. Be with all of those whose names and faces we don't know, but you surely do. We pray all of this in your son's name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. An immediate way that we can help our neighbors in Mississippi is by giving to our Presbytery's disaster fund that will go directly into these communities and stay within our state. Um, it's been depleted over the last few um, months for other disasters that have happened in our midst, including in, in Jackson and elsewhere. Um, so that is one way that Greg has told us that we can help immediately before we find out maybe how our bodies and gifts can be used um, in the future. So if you'd like to, you're welcome to write Mississippi tornadoes or just tornado relief on your check or attach it to some cash and we'll make sure it goes directly to our Presbytery um, disaster fund. But do please um, keep an eye out on the newsletter and in worship as we find out um, ways that we are being asked to help in other ways beyond, um, beyond gifts of money. Friends, let us bring our um, gifts to God and gratitude 
in response to God's gift of breath and life and wholeness. Gracious God, may these gifts be one of the ways your life-giving presence is experienced in our community. Use this money and use us to give hope to the hopeless, wholeness to the broken, and fullness to the hungry. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us sing our hymn of response number 201, A Prophet Woman Broke a Jar.
seated, and if you have celebrated or will celebrate a March birthday, I invite you to come forward as we continue a tradition we started last month. There's a lot of March birthdays, yeah. I will have you all line up and face the congregation, not just me. Um, so last month, we, the session decided to begin a tradition of celebrating birthdays and with that, asking folks to donate money to the Starkville Strong P Food Pantries in honor of these birthdays. Um, and so we will go down the line and you can just share your name and your birthday. And then I will invite everybody to pray um, the prayer printed in the bulletin. I'll start. I'm Natalie. My birthday was March 13th. Pastor, I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> March 24th, Kim Bailey. I'm Kim Bailey, March 3rd. Alice Carol Caldwell on the 14th. And I'm going to hold this for a minute because I was so happy to see those kids down here because so many of us who started this church, or I was lucky that Roberta Martin invited me and my kids were three and four years old when, when we were there. And we're so lucky to have these young people. Thank you. March 8th. <laughs> that's Shay. Richard Brown, March 13th. Don Jackson, March 13th. And I was 13 on Friday the 13th. That's oh. <laughs> Jonathan Pope, March 3rd, 53. Thank you. Please join me in the birthday blessing prayer printed in your bulletin. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you all. Happy birthday. Um, and if you guys have announcements, you're welcome to stick around. Um, but anybody else who has announcements can come forward to the wireless microphone. Um, I am clearly back um, from two weeks out. So if you sent me an email or a text and have not heard from me, um, give me until like Tuesday midday and then, and then like poke me, unless it's, unless it's more urgent. But, but give me tomorrow to go through emails and all of that. Um, and if you still haven't heard from me on Tuesday, then you're welcome to, um, to poke and wonder why I have not answered. Yeah. This is a little early, but I wanted to go ahead and give an announcement. Um, March 20, or excuse me, April 29th is the hazardous waste pickup day out at the GTR landfill. Okay, um, I, from a stewardship perspective, I can't think I look back over the years when I've helped do this at Trinity. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna park a trailer here. Those of you can just bring it up here and dump it off in that trailer and then we'll make a church-wide run. Um, I remember when we helped clean out Dean Bunch's place, you know, as a weed scientist guy, well, prop guy, all I know was is I don't know what those chemicals were. <laughs> and uh, last year, uh, Charter gave me a pound of liquid mercury, okay? <laughs> And I, ter I was terrified what that would do to the water supply in the state of Mississippi. So please, you know, look in your shops, look in your garages, you know. Yes, paint is the most common thing, but also think about poisons, think about strange things like a pound of mercury. <laughs> Two announcements. Um, number one, this Friday evening in Trinity Fellowship, we are going to have an interfaith dinner. The Turkish American uh, organization has invited everyone, and we just need a head count. Um, there are also there are options of vegetarian and vegan. Um, and what they'll do is they'll tell us what is why they fast and what it's all about, and they'll have a, a short prayer routine that they will um, demonstrate. And then when the sun goes down, we will have dinner, and they'll provide the dinner. Um, so if anybody is at all interested in interfaith um, togetherness, um, this would be a great opportunity. So that's 
Friday night, 6.20, see me so I know who's coming or how many are coming. Um, second thing, April 1st, the following Saturday, okay, so that's Friday, and then Saturday we have the International Fiesta, which is just, <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful event on the MSU drill field from 11 till 3, you're all invited, admission free, but you have to pay for your own food. And we need people to carry flags, and we need people to put flags away, so if anybody wants to volunteer, that would be fantastic. So see me, I've got two sign-up sheets, thanks. <laughs> <coughs> okay guys, it's casserole kitchen time. <laughs> We've been doing this about 15 years now and I'm proud that this church has been here from the beginning when it was organized and so forth. We have been there and with food. I can't tell you how many times. But it's our time again and I need about four uh, vegetables, dishes, uh, serve at least 12 people, okay? This, and have it at the, uh, the Episcopal Church uh, by 5.30 on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Underwood, looking ahead to Easter Sunday, um, we got, I've got two announcements. The first one on the back table where the bulletins are, you're going to find a purple, a lavender sheet that is your way to order a lily, an Easter lily that will be placed in the front, close to the altar and the cross on, on Easter Sunday. And the last day, uh, the forms are there today. They will be here again next Sunday on Palm Sunday. And you have to have everything in. The last day to order is on Wednesday the 5th of April, because we will pick them up Friday to bring to the church. So here it is, they're $10, and you write on here your name, and then please print who you want the lily to be in honor of or in memory of. So the forms are back there, and I think it's pretty well self-explanatory. That's the first thing. Second thing is, on Easter Sunday, after we have our brunch, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt. The youth group will hide the plastic Easter eggs, but we need your help filling them. We have eggs left over from years past. So I've got two of these. One I had back, back at the door, and I'm going to put this one also in the fellowship hall. There's one already over there. So what I need from you guys is candy, uh, stickers, um, any, anything small that would go inside a plastic egg. We've got plenty of eggs, so if you will just bring stuff to go in those eggs, we'll be in good shape. So either um, sometime during the week, or next Sunday, or even Easter Sunday, we'd love to have it. So that's, that's my two messages, okay? Thank you. I just wanted to thank everyone who made uh, donations that made it possible to send eight young people to Camp Hopewell for this weekend. Uh, we had a little rocky start on Friday with all the rain, but it worked out just fine. And now uh, they'll be back this afternoon, but it's been a great uh, weekend. But uh, we had eight people to go, which meant we have to also rent a van. And you guys came through and uh, provided enough uh, donations that we could send the group. Uh, they've had a great weekend, and uh, they'll be back between 2 and 2.30. But anyhow, thank all of you. Charlie Wax and I uh, did research together for our entire careers at Mississippi State. When we retired, we switched to woodworking, did uh, mostly cutting boards, however, it was so sad to see the children's play structure was roped off to make darn sure children didn't get on it. That we <laughs> went and repaired it. It now has new boards. The swings are brand new. And I hope the kids enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Springtime is flower time. Uh, the workshop will be Thursday from 4 to 5 over there. 
So we will be making paper flowers. So bring your scissors, glue. These are wrapping papers, and um, we have crepe paper, lots of crepe papers, um, skewers, and um, tissue paper. Dollar General, a dollar to give you a lot of fun. <laughs> Trinity, um, I am here. This was a quick announcement um, from my father-in-law, Clive, who says, hi, everyone. And he's very sorry he can't be in Trinity in person today during his visit to Starkville. He has a very, very bad cough and some residual pneumonia. So he decided he'd keep that to himself this morning. But he says, hiya. And um, if you want to give Clive a hug, you can give one to me. I'll pass it on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, Easter is, is two weeks away, which means next week is Holy Week. Um, I think this week's newsletter had a kind of explanation of the different things happening that week. Um, so check the newsletter. It will also be on our social media and website. Um, but we have things going on on Palm Sunday, next Sunday, um, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. Um, yeah. All right. Please rise in body or in spirit for the charge and benediction. I remembered, uh, there's something I wanted to say also. This insert, um, next Sunday we will take up the one great hour of sharing offering, which is a national denominational special offering that goes towards these three wonderful agencies, including Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, which we are well acquainted with in this area. Um, I was able to see um, tons of work in Puerto Rico um, that benefited directly from grants from these programs. Um, so please come prepared next week to um, give towards these wonderful agencies relieving hunger and helping um, with disaster relief and building up communities. Friends, remember the words of Christ. If anyone wishes to be my disciple, let them take up the cross and follow me. May the steadfast love of God the abundance, great, abundant grace of Jesus Christ and the abiding spirit of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Amen. Oh.